Well, here we are. It is Friday, September 6, 2024, and this is the weekly video. We do these each Friday. We talk about what's been going on in the auction market, uh, results from the past week, and so forth. There hasn't been a lot of results. There haven't been a lot of results from this week because there's so much getting ready to go on what's going on in New York. So this week, what we're going to do is a little bit different uh, because I've got a, a whole bunch of videos to get out in the next few days so that they're well in advance of the sales in New York. Uh, I'm going to go through some results from the Smith sale up in New Hampshire that took place this week. They had some very good results. It was an interesting auction. Uh, we had previewed that sale a couple of weeks ago. I liked it a lot. I, I, I placed a couple of bids there. I didn't get anything. I got smoked, but that's the way it is. Uh, and then we're going to get into the Doyle sale. I want to talk extensively about the Doyle sale that's coming up on the 17th and the 18th of this month. It's about 10 days away uh, because there's a lot of material here. This is they, between the, they have two sales um, uh, going and uh, on, on two consecutive days, and there are about almost 800 lots. There's a lot of material. A lot of it is very, very, very good. Uh, they had they had some real luck. I had a long conversation with Rich, uh, Richard Cervantes there uh, yesterday. We went over the sale in some detail, and uh, he's extremely happy with it. Uh, he should be, and, we're, and you'll see why in a little bit. So uh, let's get uh, going on this. But before we get into that, I want to talk about the uh, the, the uh, William Smith sale. It was up in Plainfield. I know a lot of you were, 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 were chasing stuff up there because I, I got a lot of inquiries, but the prices were extremely strong, I thought. Um, this was a very nice plate, an Amsterdam export uh, plate uh, sold for within the right in the middle of mid range of the estimate. It was estimated at five hundred to a thousand dollars, sold for seven fifty, and of course plus the premium. Always add thirty percent on to whatever you see on live auctioneers, twenty or thirty percent. In this case, it was twenty five percent, so that would put it up about a thousand dollar plate. But it's a pretty rare type of plate. You don't see these Amsterdam dishes very often, and uh, it, it did quite well. Uh, and then mo moving along over to this, this, this set got a lot of attention because it had unusual subject matter, sailing ships on all the cups. Uh, whoever collected this stuff was, a, was, a, was interested in, in maritime trade. And there were some very rare early pieces of Chinese export wear in here. And I think, I think one of the primary drivers of a lot were probably this cup on the right. Um, with, with the, with the uh, Chinese junk on it. You don't see that those very often on porcelain. And then you have some grisaille decorated European buildings. You have uh, Poseidon. How often do you, you don't see Poseidon very often on export wares and so forth. This was a nice lot and it did very well. It brought $3,000 against a four to $600 estimate. So all done, it came in at about $4,000 for this lot. But it was some really sweet, really choice pieces in there. Um, they don't have to be big to bring a lot of money. It's some very rare small pieces we all know, and you can do really well. All right, and then over to this, I had talked about these because you don't see these at all, and I was kind of surprised they didn't bring more money. These are boxwood uh, tobacco boxes, and there were three of them in the auction. And uh, boxwood was an exotic wood. It was imported into China. The, the Chinese loved um, 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 uh, boxwood and sandalwood, and uh, they had to, they used so much of it, they had to import some of it. And this one was beautifully carved, a beautifully piece, uh, a wonderfully done piece. And uh, there's the front of it with pine trees and figures. Looks to be a late 18th century example. Very, very nice work in good condition. And somebody picked it up, I think, very reasonably, 475 plus premium. Um, if this had sold for $1,500, I wouldn't have been at all surprised. These are fairly rare, and this person had four of them. And then you have this. This was the big surprise, the mythological uh, uh, dish that we talked about this a few weeks ago. It is an extremely unusual pattern of um, uh, centaurs on uh, a Japanese Amari. This is a really, really rare plate. And I, I, we, we talked about them a bit because you just don't see this pattern. Uh, it is a very rare piece. It's an 18th century or late 17th century dish. Um, nicely done. What does the back of it look like? Look at the decoration. The decoration on this was fabulous. There you go. Uh, I'm more inclined to think this was probably an early 18th century dish than a, a 17th century one. But it was very nice and very, very, very rare. And uh, with the premium, it came in at about 8000 uh, roughly about 8000 almost $8,000. And you haven't seen a, a piece of Japanese Amari sell for $8,000 in a long time. That was a heck of a strong price. But obviously, a couple of Japanese Amari collectors just had to have it. Because uh, every, anybody that looked at it would say, I, many people say, I've never even seen it. I think I saw one small piece with this kind of decoration on it once many years ago. Might have been in one of the books or something. I don't even remember where I saw it. 
but this is a very, very unusual thing. Somebody got a great item for a collection. And then this, this was a sort of a bargain. Um, this was a, a pair of 18th century figural paintings. Now these have been sold at Sotheby's in, uh, in the early 1990s. They have the receipt and everything with it. Um, and the receipt, I, I, when William Smith says he's got the receipt, he, he's reliable. Oh no, it was a, it was a newspaper ad, there you go. Um, for this lot back in, uh, what was it, 1991 or something. And they sold for about $6,000, $7,579. Um, and they were estimated at three to 6,000 uh, back in the day, as they say. Uh, what was the date on this? 1989. And somebody took a bath. But they went for 1900 plus premium this time around. That was a great buy. These were very, very nice. I, 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 was, I was kind of wondering how they'd do because these export paintings have come way down in value compared to what they were worth um, 30 years ago when the, when the China trade boom was so popular. And this shows you how much prices could change. So, you know, when you're, when you're buying antiques, um, uh, don't think of them too strongly as investments all the time because they're not. They're not. They go up and down. Uh, prices change. And uh, right now, is if you're a China trade collector, it's a great time to collect it, but a, a lousy time to sell for many. Uh, and then here's another tobacco box. This was also a very nice one. Beautifully polished, beautifully finished, lovely example. And this one was even, a, you know, a little less than the other one, four and a quarter. Uh, another fine example. It was about three and a half inches wide. And again, you don't see them very often. And in this sale, they had three of them, which is really unusual. Very, very unusual thing to see. And then over to this, the uh, tortoise shell to, uh, tobacco box or snuff box. Um, these have been around. Many, many of you have seen these before. They turn up on eBay once in a while illegally. Uh, this was a nice uh, uh, late 18th, early 19th century export example. Um, the carving on it was very good. Very, very good. Um, it had, had a hairline um, on the side here where it met the, where the top was applied because I suspect th these pieces are done in two parts. That's all that is. That's not a break. It's just a separation because they glue them together when they make them. And uh, this was a very, very lovely box. Um, I, I'm looking at it trying to see if there's anything wrong with it. There's nothing wrong with this. It went for 1000 plus premium, so about 1300 And I think that's sort of about where we figured it would come in. Uh, I think we said 1000 to $1,500. But the, the, these are marvelous. If you've ever had one um, and you get the chance to buy one, buy one. They're absolutely beautiful. The workmanship, tortoise shell carves so beautifully and polishes in such a wonderful way. Um, I really, really like these. I've always liked, I, I love carvings as many of you know. All right. And that was sort of it. This whole sale was uh, very, very good. If you want to see the rest of the results, go back. Um, and uh, uh, you can fish through um, uh, William Smith up there. He does a good job. He and Devin Moisen, I think, are... Um, and um, uh, Thomaston Place are probably the three, at this point, the three best auction houses in New England, including an auction house in Boston. I think they by far, I think they get better money, and I think they do a better job. All right, now um, let's hop along over to Doyle's. Uh, as I said, I talked to Rick yesterday, and uh, the sale is, the sales they have are very nice. They have two of them in here. Um, there's the decorative works of art. And the Asian works of art comes first. It's kind of funny. I thought they would say Asian works of one art part one, decorative works or Asian works of art part two, because the implication is that decorative works of art aren't quite as good as the Asian works of art. And they have a few things in there that aren't quite as expensive as in the first part, but there's some awfully good pieces still in there. Um, so don't let, the, don't let the decorative side of it throw you, all right? Uh, one of the pieces that caught my eye was this. It's very, very nice. Uh, Ming Dynasty Wan Li plate with a highly unusual um, serp, uh, sort of vine border with flowers. The deer are very, very standard, but the outer border on this is quite charming, very unusual. And um, it's got the, the, the mark on the back that you see on some Wan Li dishes. It's got ribbing and so forth, and this very, very uh, delicately done scroll. It's better than most of the Wan Li dishes you see around. Um, he didn't date it. He just, uh, it's got the, the Yangbo Cheng Chun mark is on the back. It's estimated at 1000 to $1,500. It's eight and three quarters inches in di uh, diameter. And it came from, apparently it was bought from um, uh, Charlotte Horchman and um, Gerald Godfrey Limited in Ho Hong Kong back in the 90s. They were uh, one of the one of the best dealers uh, there, great dealers. Uh, Charlotte Hortzman and, and, and Godfrey were well known. Um, they handled great stuff. They had a very nice gallery, and they were you know legendary experts in their day. Thirty, this they they're still re highly regarded, but very very nicely done. And then also in this sale are a lot of Kangxi biscuit wares, 
If you like Kangxi biscuit wares, you got to check this sale out. You've got to check it out. There are, I don't know, several dozen, I guess, very unusual biscuit wares. This is one of them. This is an inkstone box. Inkstone boxes do not turn up very often. Um, and it measures, uh, how big is this? Five and a half inches long. And it came from the Honorable Nellie Ionis collection. And it was originally sold by the Ralph Chait Gallery in 1991. Ralph Chait in New York has handled a lot of biscuit wares. They're, they're sort of, it's one of their, uh, one of their uh, uh, they're sort of known for biscuit wares, selling figures and so forth. Uh, they handled a lot of them from the, from the 60s through the 90s. They still do. And um, I wouldn't be surprised if maybe they try to buy some of these back because uh, they're kind of hard to get these days. But this was a very unusual type. Um, inkstone boxes. You see the statues and figures. Some of the figures are very rare too, some of the forms, but um, scholars table objects done in boxes. Uh, if you're a scholars collector, um, you won't see another one of these for a long time. And uh, I, I, you know, if you're going to chase it, expect to pay maybe 5000 for it. Um, and then there's this, this very nice Guandi Kang Shi period figure, another biscuit wear example, a very, very fine one. Uh, the figure looks to be in good shape because you want to get a condition report always. Keep saying that. But this is a nice one. It's very detailed. Lots of detail on it. And the facial expression, I think, is quite fantastic. Very, he's got the browser up and everything. And uh, there's the back of it, all decorated. Nicely done. There's the base. with the cloth. You can see the cloth patterning on the bottom. And uh, it's this is a big one. It's 12 inches tall. This is not some, you know, four or five inch thing. This thing is a foot tall. This is a big piece of porcelain. Um, and it came from the J.P. Morgan uh, collection uh, bearing the inventory, the original inventory number. And again, was sold by Ralph Chait Gallery. It's estimated at seven to $9,000, but that's pretty good provenance, J.P. Morgan. <laughs> he, he was a big Kang Shi porcelain collector. I don't know if many of you know that. He, he, he loved this stuff. Um, who was the, uh, there was a dealer back in the day that used to uh, haunt him all the time, selling him Kang Shi. Not C.T. Lu, uh, I think it was the Duveen brothers used to go in there a lot. All right, and then over to this, this very nice um, Ascetic Kang Shi uh, Buddha, uh, very nicely done, nice biscuit piece, great facial expression. The ribs are showing, he's wa you know, wasting away in this very, very nice amber glaze um, over uh, for robes, and then this light green, translucent green um, robe over him, and then the, the dyed, the colored hair. This is quite attractive. And uh, the size of this is seven inches tall. Again, Ralph Chait Gallery sold it. It's estimated at eight to 12,000. This is a fairly rare type. You don't see these very often, these ascetics. Uh, and uh, they're very popular among you know, people who are into Buddhist, Buddhist art collections. And this one looks like it's in really good shape. Looks like it's in very, very good shape. But rare forms, rare forms are, what, what, are where the, uh, it's one thing to be just biscuit wear. It's another thing if it's a rare form of biscuit wear that elevates things considerably. The opening bid is $4,000. Um, it's something worth going after. And then over to this. This is a very nice thing. Again, Ralph Chait. Wherever, wherever this consignment, these consignments came from, the best of, there's two consigners. There's, there's the Dragons um, um, uh, 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 from Michigan, and there's Chait Gallery seem to be the two primary dealers supplying um, you know, old inventory from these shops coming in. I'll get to the other dealer in a minute from Ann Arbor. Uh, but this is a very nice underglazed red uh, Foo Lion vase, uh, pear-shaped vase. These are very unusual. You don't see these very often. Uh, the red is a little brown on it, but it is underglazed red, and that's a rare bird. Um, there's the bottom. Still got the, the, the famous Chait label stuck on there. Nice concave, very, very smooth white porcelain. And this is this will give you a good look. If you come and look at this, you'll see what Kang Shi portion should look like. It shouldn't have a sugary texture to it. People often see pieces, they think they're Kang Shi, and it doesn't have this very dense, ultra smooth foot. Um, it's a little, t it, 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 they, they, they don't realize that this is what it should look like. Uh, you don't want to have it looking uh, sort of like a, like a, a sugary uh, texture to it. Um, it, should, it should be just as smooth as glass in places. And this is a nice one. Estimated 8 to 12,000, opening bid 4,000. Worth it. And then this, this is spectacular. It's a 19-inch uh, tall Kangxi period Rulu vase of some sort of a festival. Um, they didn't interpret it, but you see the boats here. They're, like, are the generals plotting strategy or something? And then they have more boats here. But I think they're playing a game is what this is, it's some sort of a game. And uh, all these figures roaming around. The, here's an, it looks to be an imperial personage or a governor or somebody important. And uh, wonderfully decorated. This is a very, very unusual vase. 
And uh, I think it's going to do, I should do better than the estimate. And here's another side of it here, uh, again with the boats and people, uh, guards outside. Uh, it looks like a palace party of some kind. Beautifully decorated. There's the bottom of it. Chait sold it uh, back in the day, I guess. And uh, if, you, if you've been looking for a really nice looking Kung Shi vase, um, um, I don't think you're going to get it for fifteen to $20,000. It's 19 inches tall. Uh, get a condition report. Maybe, it, maybe it's, you know, it's got some condition issue that's holding it down. But um, in the past, we've seen these big vases like this with this level of decoration um, sell for, you know, $40,000, $60,000. This is a very attractive vase. And there's several of these in here. So go through the catalog. There's, uh, there's a number of good vases. This was the one that I picked out. I just happened to like it the best. So it's the one I'm showing you. Uh, but it's a heck of a nice looking piece of porcelain. And then over to this, the brush pot. Another Kang, this is Kang Chi Heaven today, I guess. Chait Galleries, 1985, very beautifully painted brush pot. Very strongly painted. I love the love the willow trees, the way they're coming down. Very, they're almost like animated. And you have the soldiers in the foreground. And uh, what's on the other side of it? There you go, more soldiers and so forth. And uh, the bottom of it, there's the, uh, the base. And that's an old shape gallery label on there. But there's the bottom of it. And that's what they should look like. Um, it, there's a lot of fakes of these brush pots around. The market is flooded with them. And um, they're all trying to emulate this look with this extremely dense white porcelain. Um, and when you look at this, this is that, again, that very, very dense, super smooth white porcelain I was talking about uh, a minute ago. And this is more of it. And that's what it should look like. But be very, very leery. If it's not coming out of a major collection and being sold by a highly reputable auction company, the likely of the a Kang Shi brush pot like this being legitimate is just about zero. All right. This one is as a very reasonable estimate, two to three thousand. I think that's low. Um, it's five and a half inches tall. Uh, I think it, I think it'll probably bring more than that. So so be prepared. But it's very the estimates in here all seem pretty modest, to be perfectly honest. I think they're extremely fair. And then this this was one of my favorite pieces, this Wan Lee Mark Jar. It has damage to it, but it's so wonderfully painted. It's Mark and period. Uh, here's the side of it. It's got a chip up here on the top, which wouldn't be a difficult fix, actually. It's got a really, really nice cracked ice pattern. But notice the quality of the willow decoration coming down here. And when you see that on, on Wan Lee uh, Mark jars, you know that it's an earlier Wan Lee jar rather than a later Wan Lee jar. Because in the early Wan Lee period, they did some very, very, very fine work. And uh, notice the facial expression. I love the horse. Facial expression of the horse. All of the figure, the carrying figure here is beautifully done. But look at the detail of these the, of these uh, will, willow branches. You, you don't generally see that too much on Wan Lee pieces. And uh, here's the uh, side of it. Uh, with some ladies on a veranda with a little roof, all the detail of the roof and the pine needles and so forth. It's got that chip in it. That's all there is. That doesn't bother me at all. This is such a pretty, unusual jar. Uh, it's four and three quarter inches in height. They're giving it just an estimate of eight to twelve hundred dollars with a four hundred dollar opening bid. Um, I, I suspect it's going to do a lot better than that. I suspect this will bring five or six or seven times estimate, I think, because I think it's a heck of a nice piece of porcelain. But this auction, these auctions this week, uh, between the major auction houses and Doyle and, and Freeman's and Christie's and Sotheby's and all these, it's going to be a real test. I've been saying it for weeks, it's going to be a test of the market. And uh, some of them are showing that they think it might be a test too. I noticed um, 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 uh, the way some of the reserves and estimates were done at Christie's, they, they seem a little timid this time around. And uh, we'll see, we'll see. And uh, then you have this, the Shunji uh, or the Kangxi period. I think this is probably Shunji, but it's look at the food, look at the look at the drag, the the the, the on here. Very very animated, bright enamels, bright reds, strong greens. It doesn't have its lid, uh, but boy, what a what a very very striking jar it is. And uh, if you flip it over, um, it's got the Jade Dragon uh, mark. Now, if you don't know about Jade Dragon. They were, they were, he passed away, the man that owned it. He ran it with his wife. He was out in Ann Arbor, Michigan for years. They, uh, and I was talking to Richard about it yesterday because, because everybody knew about him from years and years ago. He was sort of a mecca in the Midwest for, for, for Chinese stuff. And he would, Rick reminded me that when they, we, they did shows in Asia, and it would be the, like the most popular booth there because they brought the stuff they found in estates in America. They found all kinds of interesting, interesting things. And he had the, the gentleman had a very, very uh, uh, unique eye for what he, what he valued and what he appreciated. He, he, he loved a good, strong aesthetic. 
Um, he liked he liked uh, market period things, but he also liked things that had strong sort of emotional looks for them, so, somewhat dramatic maybe. Uh, and it didn't have to be extremely old. It just had to be beautiful. And there are a number of pieces in here that will show you what we're, we're talking about. I think we're going to get to some of them. But at any rate, this is estimated at peanuts, $1,522,000. It, uh, it should blow through that. It's 12 inches tall. This came from the Alan Abramson collection originally. And... Uh, you, you've got to think this will bring six to eight thousand, or five to seven thousand, or at the minimum four to six. But I think what one fifteen hundred to two, I think it's just you know Doyle's way of saying it's it's here to be sold. When you see low estimates like that, they're here to sell it. And the same thing goes for this. This is a Joan de Marc Kangxi period um, uh, brush washer, and you hardly ever see Kangxi brush washers. Again, rare scholar's table object, very nicely painted, looks to be in good condition. Go around it. There's the mark of uh, the Joan the mark on the bottom. It is not Joan de, obviously, but um, it's kind of an unusual mark to see on the bottom of a brush of a brush washer like this. But definitely a Kangxi bottom. And um, let's see uh, what's the estimate: four to six thousand, two thousand to start it. Uh, yeah, it should get there. It's a scholar's object. This is sort of like that biscuitware box we just looked at. Uh, very, very desirable um, um, for, for collectors. All right. And then this, this is also from, uh, I believe, from Jade Dragon. This was a, a extremely attractive. There's the, the bottom. Yeah, Jade Dragon, Ann Arbor, Michigan. This is the kind of stuff he loved. And uh, wonderfully, very elaborately drawn Kangxi bowl with, with wave patterns and so forth. Chen Bar Mark, but Kangxi bowl. But notice the, all the, the, this very, very finely done border pattern with clouds. And then you have the, the dragons crashing in and out of the waves all the way around. Very classical Chinese scene. Um, and it just it just travels all the way around. The interior's got a dragon in it. It's in very, very nice condition. And the estimate is peanuts. Look at the estimate. Five to seven hundred dollars, seven inches in diameter. It is going to do better than that. They, they don't really think it'll bring that, I don't think. If they did, it, it's a it's a steal. Um, but it, it should bring uh how was it? What was it again? Seven inches? It should bring two to three thousand, I would think. It's very attractive, and it's beautifully potted. Uh, the potting on this bowl is extremely even and nice, and the cobalt color is very, very desirable. The patterns are unre unusual, and, uh, and it's very, very decorated. So I, I think the estimate is, is, is a bit on the low side, but that's okay. Low estimates are good. It encourages competition. Uh, it's got 20 bidders watching it so far in the auctions in a week. And then this. This, I think, is from the, from the Jade Dragon. Yeah, it is. Now, this is a, not a, it's marking, it has a Chinlung mark on it. It's not Chinlung. It's 19, or probably early 19th century. But look at the shape of this thing. This is wonderful. And the color is that very, very soft um, celadon that you see on 18th century uh, porcelains. Uh, the Kangxi period, they had a soft celadon green they used. Maybe not as light as this. This one's really, really light. It may be the lighting, too. But um, how tall is this thing? This is a 15-inch vase, and it was purchased in 1990 at, uh, at the Halstead Collection in Birmingham, Michigan. That's where he got it. And, of course, it's a, it's a very early form. It's an 18th century form. They did do these in the Chin Lung period, and the estimate would be through the roof if it was from then. But, boy, this is a – look at the, the workmanship, the pullback, the outlining of the white on, on, the, on, the, on their mask and ring handle. This is a nice piece of porcelain. Um, it has a chin lung mark on the bottom, but you look at the mark, you know it's it's got the brown stained foot, just like uh, you expect on 18th century and early 19th century pieces. But the mark isn't done quite right. As you can see, it's a little crowded and messed up looking. doesn't matter. Uh, the estimate is uh, very reasonable, two to 3,000, 1,000 opening bid, uh, 15 inches tall, very pretty. And it hasn't been drilled as a lamp, which is nice because th this is the kind of vase they used to love to drill out. And then over to this. This is really interesting. This is a, uh, a crackle glazed 18th century uh, uh, a pot. They're dating it to the uh, uh, Chin Lung period. Um, looks like it might be a little dirty. Unusual form, though, but beautiful, beautiful done. It's a, what are they, they're just calling it a bulbous uh, vase. Uh, there it is, crackle. Yeah, it's, it's 18 cent. I don't think it's Kang Chi. It's got a bunch of old uh, collection laters, labels on the bottom that look legitimate. Again, the Jade Dragon. This was how, the kind of stuff he liked. He loved these funky, um, very aesthetically strong things. He rem his, his taste in porcelain reminds me, when we talked last year, we looked at the Robert Klein collection. That sort of aesthetic, that sort of taste, um, is very, you'll see a lot of it in this kind of stuff. 
this kind of this is the kind of stuff that people like Robert Klein would love. Um, the kind of thing you find in old collections. Um, that in Ann Arbor, Michigan, has some very good collections. Um, during the during the Industrial Revolution, there was a lot of a lot of wealth in that area. Uh, the automobile industry, all that development going on, a lot of them collected Asian art. So it's 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 no no mis it's no by accident that he's out there. Um, he was out there for so many years. This one is nine inches tall, four to six thousand dollar estimate. Aesthetically, I think it's absolutely beautiful, and I love the crackle. So we'll see how that does. And then hopping along over to this rugs. This is a nice rug. It's a 19th century uh, uh, Ning Shai carpet done in the Ming, sort of like a Ming carpet with the, uh, the soft salmon background with, with yellow and, and then the flowers, the, the lotus blossoms all over it, and then the vine border. This is a room size rug. It looks like a scatter rug. It's not. It's a room size rug. The estimate is nothing. Eight to twelve hundred dollars. It's six feet long. Well, it's not quite a room size rug. It's four by six. It's a, you know, it's a big scatter rug, but it's an absolutely beautiful rug. Absolutely beautiful, rare type of rug, and it looks like it's in good shape. Um, I'm trying to spot, I'm trying to look for some really bad low spots on it, and I don't see any. And uh, they showed a pretty good photograph of the back of it. Uh, there it is. And that's that's a that's a that's a 19th century back. That's how they wove them. And when you pick these up, they're floppy. They're very loose. They're very very soft, lustrous wool. And there you don't find a lot of Chinese rugs around from the 19th century because the wool was so soft. In Western homes with hard shoes, they just got worn to pieces very rapidly. Um, the wool was not as durable as some of the Persian wools and the Central Asian wools. Uh, it just wasn't. It was. It was very soft, though. It was as soft as butter. But um, in, in Chinese houses, you know, you wear. You know, people would wear slippers when they walked on the rugs, so they didn't wear down fast. But in the West, you know, high-heeled shoes destroy Oriental rugs. Um, because of the, the amount of weight that goes out of the spike of the heel. Fortunately, not many people wear them anymore. So um, people who used to make a pretty good living repairing the wefts and warps of rugs broken by uh, rotund ladies in high heels uh, is sort of over. All right, and then moving over to this, bronzes. Um, uh, I don't know how many of you know the name Michael Goodhuis. Uh, Goodhouse, Goodhuis. He's a, br a British dealer. He's still around. Um, he... he does and started out is is that we got a phenomenal reputation with bronzes. This was a bronze he apparently handled, the gilt gilt bronze, high relief work, beautifully done. Looks to be an 18th century one. They didn't date it. I'm not sure why. It's it's not new. That's for sure. Um, there's the bottom. There's the foot. All that wear on the foot. This looks like an 18th century. Could be early. Maybe maybe it's Tai Jing period. But it's a beautiful beautiful example. And it's a pr pretty good size. It's eight and a half inches tall. And there it is, Michael Goodreese, London. Um, and he, he was, he, he handled some great things. I, he used to come to do the New York show. I would see him, see him there in his booth. He, he brought some great things. He also, he also was handling contemporary Chinese art. I think he also does that. He's very diverse. <laughs> but he knows a lot about Chinese metalwork and Asian metalwork in general. All right. And then hopping along over to this, the pair of Kong vases, Chinlung Mark, and of the period. Very nicely done. Um, beautiful, beautiful high feet on them. The colors are, uh, are, are nice and soft. They're slightly muted. Very elegant, and tasteful. Uh, I like, the, I like, the, I love the shapes of these. Um, very attractive. And uh, how tall? Are they? About a foot tall, probably. Uh, oh, these are huge. Twenty-one inches. Oh, I didn't see that before. Those are massive. Those are huge. I, most, most of these square vases, these square cogs you see, they're 11 or 12 inches. I didn't check the height on this before I did the video. 21 inches tall. These are beasts. And uh, very unusual form. Very, very unusual form. Oh, that, that's thrilling. That's going to be exciting. There's the bottom of it. Chin Lung. They certainly appear to be marking period. Um, ten to $15,000 uh, is the estimate. That seems... Given their size, that seems awfully low. That seems like the price for one of them. Uh, but we'll see what happens. Why don't we bookmark that and we'll come back and take a look at it. But that these are very, very nice. If you like cloisonne, these are the very, very fine wired examples they did with and the birds and the willow trees in here. It's beautiful scenes, beautiful, beautiful like paintings. And uh, then hopping along over to this. This was an unusual thing. If you like unusual quirky it's sort of I love this kind of stuff because it's not it's not what everybody else is chasing all the time it's a sandstone box with a, a, a pewter tea caddy inside of it this is a, a, a soapstone rather 
and it's wonderfully carved. It's 19th century, I'm assuming. Yeah, it's 19th century, um, but it's 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 done like an altarpiece or something, where it steps up, and the color is very very nice. How big is this thing? Eight inches in height. It's pretty good size. Um, 19th century box. There's there's the pewter liner. Um, the, there's the the base with a bunch of inscriptions on it. This is a if you like unusual things and you you maybe maybe a little bit like me. I like monochromes and crackle pieces and oddball pieces and very things that have a really interesting aesthetic to them. I love this thing. This is a good thing. The estimate, I think, is very fair. A thousand to fifteen hundred dollars, five hundred dollar opening bid. And there are only five people watching it so far, which is kind of surprising. Uh, but but if if you if you're a collector and you like carved things and sort of intimate personal things, this is a good object. It's a very nice object. And then over to this. This is another piece of Michael Good Goodwish. This is exceptional. Um, I think the estimate is terribly low on this. He's dated. They're dating it as uh, late Ming to early Qing, which is fine. Could be. Um, I think it's probably late Ming, judging by the handles and the and the depth of the casting. This is so deeply cast and then gilded in the in the low and and in some of the high areas. This was sold by Michael Goodreads. It's about five inches in diameter, uh, a little over five inches, I think five and a half inches wide, but it's very bold and gutsy. This is a very very bold incense burner. It's, it's just, it just it's it's got a real a real aesthetic, real strong sense of power to it. Um, there's the end of it, and I love the wear to the gold, the gilding. There's the uh, the label for Michael, um, but very very attractive. You want to get a condition report? Make sure you know the handles haven't been glued on with crazy glue, but I don't think they have. Uh, but a thirteen hundred dollar opening bid is nothing on this, um, and and this is a, and if if you collect bronzes, think about the last time you might have seen a bronze that's this deeply cast with all that gilding on it intact. Because the gilding usually is the first thing to go, as we all know. This has a lot of gilding left on it for for a, a three four hundred dollar a three or four hundred year old uh, casting, and um, I wouldn't be at all surprised if it doubled tripled that estimate. It's a very very nice bronze. If you like bronzes, you should buy it. Really, it's not you're not going to see another one of these for a long time. And I'm very I'm very I'm kind of excited about the sale, as you can tell. I, I really went through it yesterday. I was absolutely amazed at some of the stuff that they picked up. And then you have this bronze who Ming Dynasty or earlier. Um, it's a nice one, 11 inches tall, very reasonable estimate, two to three thousand dollars, thousand dollar opening bid. Um, the silver would clean up on this, by the way. Um, these these inlaid silver uh, uh, things, um, you can gently clean them up lightly with silver foam. It won't hurt the bronze at all if you do it properly, and it'll bring out the color of the silver if you want to. There's, I, I don't. Some people say you shouldn't. I don't see any harm in it because you get to see what. It, was supposed to look like when it was new because silver notoriously tarnishes. The gold looks fine. The gold will be fine. And uh, you could go over it lightly with silver polish to pull out highlights of silver. It won't hurt it a bit. And it'll tone back down in about three months anyway. But do it just for the fun of it to see what it looks like. This is a nice looking bronze. I like the rings on it. Uh, $1,000 opening bid. Not bad. And then this. This is a gem. This is a gem. This is a Yamo period Buddha that's lacquered. And it's big. It's 19 inches tall. But look at the quality of the carving on this thing. The way the robes, the folds of the robes. Absolutely stunning. Absolutely stunning. And the hands are intact, which is almost a miracle. Uh, but you go down it and just look at the way the symmetry of the robes, the way they're done. And then down layer by layer down to the feet. And then the feet are sort of puffy the way they do. Uh, the, and the toes are all detailed and everything. But this is a very, very unusual uh, example and in, in beautiful condition. There's the side of it. It's on a lotus base. There's the inscription up the back with the the pan. They took the panel off. Um, there it is. And then again, the draping of the robes. The the robe work on this is is one of the best I've ever seen. Actually, it's it's exceptionally fine. And uh, the estimate is eight to twelve thousand. And it is nineteen and three quarter inches. It's a twenty inch tall figure. That's a big one, and it's in beautiful condition. And what's interesting, I didn't see any damage to the lacquer. Uh, the lacquer on these are often damaged, so obviously it came out of some place where they were taking good care of it. And if you buy it, you take care of it too. All right, and then we'll get over into the, this is the, the other part of the sale. This is the next day, the decorative works. I'm only going to go through a few, I'm going to go through about eight of these, uh, but there's some good things in here. So, so, so go over and check at your leisure. Uh, but ask questions now. 
Um, um, uh, uh, I mentioned it last week that people have a tendency to look at things, look at things, look at things. And then the day before the sale, they start sending in requests for condition reports and information and wanting to talk to somebody. And the, 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 that window closed. You can't do it the day before. It's, well, you can, but it's awfully hard. And it's awfully rough on the, on the auctioneer because they have to stop what they're doing and they're dealing with other things by that point getting set up. This is a very nice Ming Dynasty uh, a dragon plaque. You maybe remember a couple of weeks ago, uh, 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 Josh Chamberlain had some Ming plaques at his sale and uh, they did very, very well. And this, this is a similar sort of beast, fully reticulated right through the back. This is a good plaque. And the estimate is very low. It should, it's going to bring f three or 4,000, maybe 5,000, I expect. Uh, but this is just 1,500 to 2,000. It's got only four people watching it, but the, this, this listing just went up in the last 24 hours, I believe. Uh, so you want to check that out or the, a couple of days ago. This is a good, good carving, and it measures six inches long. It's, in good, it's a good size one. Now this, this is dandy. It's a Republic period, but it's an, a, a very deeply carved agate teapot with or, or, no, naturalistic you know, branch and root handles, you know, little critters on the top, and then you have the apple blossoms coming off of it in high relief. And this rather attractive sort of bleached wood stand with wire inlay. Um, there's the other side of it. This is a beautiful piece of agate, though. It's beautifully carved. And um, um, it was done, yeah, it was done between 1915 and 1930. Uh, they still were doing some very good carving then. And the estimate is reasonable, 750 um, to start it and 1500 to 2000 to buy it. And I think that's probably about right. This is, agate's expensive rock, you know, and this is a nice one. And then over to this, the double gourd bronze um, with the chimeras on it. Uh, nice one, good condition. Sometimes you see these with gilding, gilt splashes on them. Sometimes you don't. But this is a good one. It certainly does appear to be very early Qing. Um, possibly Ming, possibly Ming. It's hard to say. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of blurry areas in between. But it's a, a, a beautiful piece. There's the with the top off, um, estimated very reasonably. It's six inches tall, so it's about that big, and it's estimated at six to eight hundred dollars. That's very reasonable. Uh, it could it could go for a thousand or fifteen hundred, and then hopping along over to this is very nice 19th century Qing robe. Um, the colors are good. Uh, this is one of these classic robes that we've all seen a million times, but this is a good one. It's got a few poles on the shoulder. Um, the, the colors overall look pretty good. You want to get a condition report on robes always. Make sure the lining is intact and all that. Uh, they didn't provide a lot of pictures of it, so I think they assume you're just going to get a hold of them anyway. Um, it's estimated $1,000 to $1,500. It's going to do better than that. It'll probably bring four to 6000 but uh, it'll get you encouraged anyway. It's only a $500 opener, so uh, that's not bad. And then over here to this, this is a, another, this is a basin. 14-inch uh, basin, Shunji period to early Kangxi era. Uh, there it is. And uh, underglaze blue with underglaze red flowers. Very unusual. And the kids are riding ponies and carrying banners just like mom and dad. And, <laughs> and, uh, and then they have their banners down here. And these are the kids galloping in. One of them is riding a killin, um, uh, the, the young boy here. And then there's another bannerman. And there's another one carrying a lotus leaf to shade them so they, the little, they don't burn their little precious heads in the sun. And, uh, and uh, then you have this vine coming in, filling out the inner border, which is a nice effect. And it's a basin, again, 14 inches in diameter, four to $6,000 estimate, $2,000 starting price. But uh, Shunji to Kangxi period, I, to me it looks, what's the back of it look like? Let's take a look. You know, it could be Kangxi, it could be Shunji. Yeah, yeah they're right. Because these, these, these track foot rims or groove foot rims um, appeared at, at, at the at the end of the uh, Shunji and into the early Kangxi era, as far as I know. But I love the way they did the tree coming over the border, over the back, like this, spreading it out that way. Very nicely done. And a triple line. Look at that. It's got a triple line in, on the outside of the foot. Usually it's just a double. It's interesting. All right. So chase that down. And then uh, for this, if you like monochromes, um, I would suggest getting a, getting a, they're dating it very conservatively. They're calling it Qing Dynasty or later. Uh, the crackle in the surface of this and the color of it, um, to me, it looks, it, looks, it looks earlier. But they didn't include a picture of the bottom, so I'd love to see the foot rim on this. Because it seems older to me. It's got that older looking feel and these, these black striations. And you don't really, they don't usually look like that from the late Qing and, or you know, late Qing or Republic period. 
Maybe, maybe they do. I'd want to see the foot on that. I want to see what this thing looks like. The estimate is $1,000 to $1,500. If it's 18th century, it's got to do very well. This is a beautiful, aesthetically beautiful thing. Almost just a little under seven inches a night, six and three quarters. Opening bid, $500. Not bad. And then over to this, another transitional period jar. And uh, <laughs> Rick told me he tried to get the top off of this. Apparently, they I guess it's got hide glue on it. They couldn't get it off. They got the bottom off, but they couldn't get the top off. So whoever buys it, if they want the if they want the Ormolu from the 19, you know 1910 or 20 or whenever this was mounted uh, off, you're gonna have to soak it in hot hot water for a, a, you know for an afternoon. And it'll loosen up the hide glue enough you can pull it. But it has ascending and descending dragons. This is the, you know because that's how dragons are depicted: descending out of the ocean and coming back into the ocean. That's the two directions basically. And uh, here he is ascending, uh, I mean descending in yellow. And there's there's the uh, the inside of the lid. Looks like it's got an old line there. Uh, you want to check that out. And it was a table lamp, obviously, because it was drilled. There's the hole. And you see all kinds of grime and grunge and crud down there. Very typical of these, especially if they've been under mounts. And here's the uh, front of it with the ascending the ascending dragon in green coming up with red hair. But a very attractive example. Um, the estimate is 1000 to 1500 In the past, we've had we've seen somewhat similar examples of these. It was a foot tall. This is a foot tall. And they sell for three to four thousand, so I think it's going to go. It's, it should go over well over the estimate, even if it has a hairline in it. It doesn't make a heck of a big difference. And then over to this, there's another Wutsai transitional period pot with. I think I think these all came out of the same house, probably somewhere up around East 63rd Street, I suspect. Uh, this is a very nice one, uh, very well done. Uh, I, I find the Ormolu on it a little bit distracting, but. Uh, it's a it's a very nice looking example. Uh, nice hazy blue up in here. The greens are good and strong. The reds are nice. Uh, I like the, uh, the the flaming border around the top. And here you have a, a personage with a fan and an attendant. He's obviously Mr. Big. And uh, yeah, it's a nice one. Heck of a lamp, isn't it? Uh, two to three thousand dollars transitional era. Transitional, transitional. Yeah, look it up. Look some of these up. Uh, if you have any the Butler book or the Shunji book that Mr. Butler was involved with, look it up because uh, I think there might be some nice examples in here to learn from um, as well. But this is this is a nice one. And how big is the uh, height of the vase? Is 21 inches. So this is a big thing. Um, the, it says here that the vase is 21 inches tall. I would confirm that, and that it's not the lamp height. That looks like 24 inches. I'd be surprised if that little pot. If this is 21 inches, how tall is the lamp? Six feet? Yeah, I think I think that's a typo. Double check on that when when you get a hold. I'm going to bet the whole lamp is 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 that size. Um, um, height of uh, height of vase and lamp 21 inches. I can't imagine that that's 20 almost two feet from there to there. But it doesn't matter. It's a I, I spoke when I was describing it. I was assuming it was you know nine or ten inches in height. It's very nice. And hopping along over to this, the punch bowl. Uh, this jumped out at me. This is a 16-inch, um, 18th century Chinese Amari punch bowl. But look at the amount of gilding that's still on it. This was great. You see these bowls around, and, and people say, oh, I've seen that pattern before, but it looked different. Yeah, because all the gilding is gone. This one still has all of its gilding, which is almost a miracle. And uh, there's the back of it with the willow pattern and the mountains and the boats and a very detailed uh, junk or sand pan over here. And uh, there's the other side of it, and there's the interior of it, and there's the bottom of it. And I don't see any cracks, breaks, lines, damage, restorations, or anything. And that certainly is an 18th century foot from what I'm seeing. And uh, it's 16 inches, estimated at 1,500 to 2,000. That's very reasonable. 16-inch um, early 18th century bowls like this don't show up very often. Um, some some people think it may be Kung Shi too. Um, should it should bring. Two to three thousand should go a, a, a thousand or two, or maybe four should go a, a thousand or two over the high estimate. So uh, stick around for that. And then at the end of this sale, there's also a lot of Japanese stuff. But at the end of the in the in the end of the second sa second day, there's some really nice um, uh, Han um, uh, pottery pieces, um, uh, uh, grain storages and furniture and all kinds of stuff. They look to me like there are about thirty or so lots of it. So if you like early Han. Um, pottery. Check out this. Check it out at the, at the end on day two. There's quite a bit of it there. Uh, this one is estimated very modestly at four to six hundred dollars. Han Han piece. It is 
14 inches tall. Um, you, and I, I bet it goes for around 500 to five, 700 maybe. These are very interesting. They're very early, and they sell for about a third of what they were selling for 30 years ago because people, I don't know, they don't care about rustic, um, really old stuff, I guess. They want everything fresh and fancy and brand new. Uh, <laughs> but this is a very nice one. And the glaze on, 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 on it is very, very attractive. And you can see how they fired it upside down because the glaze drips are going up. And that means that they dipped it, they held it by the feet when they glazed it, and they did it that way. And then you have these droplets forming around the top of the mouth of the piece. And they haven't been broken off yet, which is sort of a miracle. Um, and it's a $200 starting bid. It's a no-brainer, folks. And then on to this, the porcelain uh, Amari uh, charger. This was a very big charger. I was just talking to a man this morning who had a charger that he's getting restored because it got broke by the auction. Well, not... The auction house that sh had it shipped, the, the shipping company didn't pack it well enough, I guess, and they broke it. Um, he's getting it, getting it fixed. It's a beautiful platter. But at any rate, this is even bigger. This is That one was 19 inches. This is a 21-inch wide Amari porcelain, um, late 18th, early 19th century, basket seen in the center, these big you know open areas up here with peonies and lotus blossoms, and then you have two foo lions on the sides, and there's the back of it. And that's the back of a, of, a, of a late 17th, early 18th century piece of Amari. You still see the spur marks. And there's this obvious slight green tinge to it. And I think some of this may be house dirt, too. You always want to clean these up with a paper towel and some, you know, some sort of, not, not, not ammonia, but fantastic or something. that will just soap, and the surfactants will just get the dirt off. But this is the back of it. It's what it should look like. And notice the spur marks. They're like almost like rice seeds. They were very small in some occasions on these old pieces. And it doesn't have a heavy, thick foot rim. So you had to use the spur marks to support it. This is a very, very thin, very refined foot rim that they used on this. It's quite attractive. I, I, I love these big, big chargers. Love big platters. This is a beast. 21 inches is very, very big for early 18th century. And it's got the, the very famous, you know, uh, uh, you know the, the the burner in the middle with the flowers coming out of it, but uh, very very nice. All right, and I and I've sort of whizzed through the whole thing. Uh, it, well, not the whole thing. There's a lot of stuff here. Like I said, there are 780 or 770 lots in this sale. There's also Isnik tiles. If you like Isnik, Isnik is extremely rare and beautiful. I had the pleasure of owning a number of bits of it over the years, and uh, very expensive, <laughs> and uh, great to sell, tough to buy. But uh, there's a lot of other things. There's some good Japanese stuff, some prints, um, loads of Chinese material, loads of bronzes, loads of jades. Enough said. Uh, check it out. You got 10 days. Uh, get your, uh, you know, get your uh, bids in um, and uh, pay attention to the timing of the sale. It's East Coast time. And, uh, you know, make sure you don't miss out. All right. Thanks so much for watching. Thank you for subscribing. Um, we'll be doing more videos next week. I'm going to uh, do a, a, a deeper dive into uh, the other auction houses and take a look at what they're doing. We'll do probably two, two or three of them next week in advance of the sales. And then we'll go back and we'll do the uh, uh, autopsy afterwards to see who, who flew and who, who might not have and what the overall results were and what the market's saying about things because it's sort of interesting times we're living in, as they say. All right. Thanks a lot. Subscribe if you haven't. Leave a comment. Tell me what your favorite thing is. If there's something here that you really, really like, tell me. Tell me. What the, I, I love to hear what people buy because uh, everybody is, has such interesting uh, input on what they're interested in. Not, not if you're a dealer, if you're looking to sell things. That's, that's, that's business. But if you're looking to really collect it to own it, uh, I want, I'd love to hear what you're, what, you're, what you're after. All right. And have a good weekend. Bye-bye.